as a Hong Konger, uh, I don't want the world uh, to face the same fate. We have to learn from the painful lesson of Hong Kong. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the First Amendment Museum's one-on-one -on -one series. The First Amendment Museum is a nonpartisan nonprofit located in Augusta, Maine. I'm Max Nospish, Manager of Visitor Experiences. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Finn Lau. Finn, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Finn Lau, one of the several Hong Kong advocates in exile, officially wanted by the Hong Kong and Beijing regimes. It's because of my uh, works, especially international efficacy, efficacy works, and underpilling some uh, key pillars or ideological pillars for the 2019 Hong Kong movement. So since 2020, uh, I have been officially in exile and uh, forced into exile. And before that, I partic participated in the 2019 Hong Kong movement, and then I was arrested. Uh, in Hong Kong, and I was detained there for more than 50 hours uh, under inhumane conditions, and I was ambushed uh, by some CCP agents in London in the same year as well. What are the goals and purposes of free expression, free speech, freedom of assembly, and freedom of the press, the things we sort of cherish in a democratic world? Well, I say that the freedom of expression, uh, assembly, uh, freedom of press, etc., they are the basic civil liberties that could uh, pave way for a vibrant civil society. Without this uh, freedom of expression, then we would not have any vibrant society. And because we have lost all those civil liberties in Hong Kong, especially after 2019, you can see that Hong Kong uh, is facing some sort of uh, downfall. Uh, we used to be one of the uh, hubs, uh, maybe cultural and economic hubs in uh, Asia. Uh, we used to have, we used to serve as the safe harbor to many people, or many dissidents from the mainland China or from many different countries. But right now, because of the Draculian national national security law, we have lost or downgraded from the safe harbor or to be, or I would say, more one of the places that is under the brutal suppression. Uh, by the Beijing regime, or the, to be precise, the Chinese Communist Party. So in Hong Kong, you popularized a protesting strategy called Lam Chow. What is it and how does it work? Well, uh, this is a popular Cantonese land we used to uh, use when we play poker games or other games in Hong Kong could be literally translated as if we burn, you burn with us. So we stand for uh, Hong Kongers and then you stand for the Chinese Communist Party. But the essence of the, this idea is that we have to call for uh, international uh, sanction against the Chinese Communist Party. We have to tackle, we have to drain the financial and economic resources of the Chinese Communist Party while Hong Kong is being suppressed. So Hong Kongers, including myself, we are determined to sacrifice ourselves to tell the world what is the truth or what is the consequences of uh, trusting or compromising with the Chinese Communist Party. Especially because uh, back in the 1980s, Hong Kongers, we trust the Chinese Communist Party. So we would uh, often have some sort of a regular uh, economic uh, exchange or uh, so-called cultural exchange uh, with the mainland China. However, after the 1997 handover between the UK and the PRC, that is China, then we are seeing that, well, we, are, uh, we were losing uh, our judiciary system, our independent judiciary system, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, all sorts of civil liberties in Hong Kong. So that is uh, the, the painful lesson that we want to tell the world. And that's why we want to bring down the CCP with us. So why did you decide to go into self-imposed exile out of Hong Kong? Uh, most people watching and listening will probably never know what it's like to go into any form of political exile. So can you tell us a little bit about what, what it's like and what effect it's had on you? Well, uh, my I would say my story or journey uh, is maybe a, a little bit different from other people who are forced into exile because uh, back in 2019, I lived in London, uh, in the UK. Uh, when the uh, one million uh, mass demonstration protests broke out in Hong Kong. 
And then I was so determined to go back to Hong Kong because I want to witness what's happening in Hong Kong in, uh, with my own eyes. I want to participate uh, in the protest in person. That's why I risked my life to go back. I was arrested alongside uh, with a few hundred others when I was participating in a peaceful one million uh, protest in Hong Kong. Luckily, during the 50 hours of detention uh, in the police station, they didn't figure out my identity as one of the leaders of the 2019 Hong Kong movement. But then uh, after being released, I would just, I understand that, well, it's just a matter of time that they will correlate myself uh, with those, uh, what they have been investigating on my, on my persona. That's why I decided to change uh, my mind and then to fly back to London. And then several uh, months later, say uh, five months later after being released, I was ambushed uh, by three CCP agents near my house uh, during a lockdown period. And then two months after uh, being ambushed and uh, attached to near death in London, uh, I was officially wounded uh, by the Hong Kong and the Beijing governments. So since then I have been forced into exile. Uh, luckily, uh, I have overcome all sorts of uh, these uh, mental challenges and I decided to go uh, a step further rather because uh, up, uh, instead of uh, giving up, I would say that it is more important for me to continue to fight on behalf of my fellow Hong Kongers, especially because many of my friends, they are now in jail. While I am uh, so-called enjoy relative freedom uh, in uh, some democratic countries like the UK, then I should exercise my rights, uh, my rights uh, of expression, my uh, rights uh, of speech, yeah, to continue my fight, to voice out for uh, for my Hong Kongers. So, so that's why I decided to go public in the end. So you founded a group called Hong Kong Liberty. Uh, what is that and what are its goals? Well, uh, this is a long story again, because uh, back in 2019, I founded two groups. The first one is Hong Kong Liberty. Uh, that was founded on the day that we got 1 million people marching on the street of Hong Kong. On that day, I was participating in a London rally and we got around 3,000 people standing outside the Chinese embassy. And on while standing there, I just think that perhaps we could do much more there must be more ways to harness the individual brain or the intellectual of uh, every Hong Konger that's overseas. So that's why uh, when I was on my way home, then I uh, came up with the idea of uh, sanctioning the Hong Kong government officials. We have to advocate a uh, sanction against the Beijing and Hong Kong officials who are uh, complicit of uh, human rights violation, who are uh, responsible for the brutal suppression of the Hong Kong protests. So this is the way that we could leverage uh, against the uh, to the Tyrannian regimes in Beijing and Hong Kong. So uh, on that night, then I uh, articulate my ideas uh, on one of the most prominent online forum, RHKG forum. And then my post simply uh, went viral. I didn't expect that because I, see I got around 2000 responses within uh, one night. And then I uh, picked a number of people, a dozen of uh, Hong Kongers to form a team to work on this project. Since then, uh, Hong Kong Liberty uh, is formed. And then in early July, 2019, that is one month after forming uh, Hong Kong Liberty, I decided to form another team that is more UK specific. Mm -hmm. uh, that is called Stand of Hong Kong team, Fights for Freedom Stand of Hong Kong team. Because at that time, well, I would say that uh, UK uh, as a country, they got a special responsibility to handle or to respond to the situation in Hong Kong, especially because uh, Hong Kong was handed over uh, from the UK to, to China without any uh, referendum or consultation in Hong Kong. So, uh, and then back in the 1980s, uh, the UK and the China, Chinese regime, they have signed it, uh, uh, the Sino-British Joint Declaration under which uh, Hong Kongers and Hong Kong uh, are guaranteed with at least 50 years of uh, civil liberties, uh, independent judicial system, autonomy, and democracy, and so on. But even before hitting the 25th uh, and the February milestone, we have lost everything uh, under the Beijing regime. That's why we had to uh, act uh, to do something uh, in the UK. So that is uh, how uh, both teams were formed. Now, you've already sort of hinted at this, uh, but does the Chinese Communist Party have influence beyond its borders? And should the rest of the world be watching? And 
should the rest of the world even maybe be worried given that China's global stature is only rising? Yeah, um, the Chinese Communist Party is exerting uh, its uh, geopolitical influence uh, over many different countries, not just uh, those developed countries, but also uh, developed countries. So you could you may from time to time hear something like uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. That is something that they are using the money and power and even materials to lure different developed countries into their uh, global outreach. On the other hand, in different uh, democratic countries like Canada, uh, UK, US, or even Australia, we are facing different sorts of infiltration or uh, to be precise, uh, something called United Front Works. Because in those countries, well, uh, very often they would use uh, under the name of uh, academic or maybe under the name of economic exchange or cultural exchange to try to buy some people to buy their hearts. Uh, such that uh, they could soft or uh, lobby those people to support those uh, trade agreements and many different agreements, international agreements that is favorable uh, to the Beijing regime. So that is something that we are facing. On the other hand, uh, they are using this sort, different sorts of uh, companies or maybe um, different commercial business uh, to infiltrate into different countries. For example, uh, we got a number of companies that are being banded or sanctioned by the US and UK or even uh, the EU uh, government. Uh, that is, uh, for example, uh, while there are some sorts of uh, supervision or surveillance uh, companies or uh, technology they are using uh, to deploy to, to get to collect more data uh, from the world. So these are the uh, different things that we have to be aware of. And well, I would say that Hong Kong, we have, uh, I would say we have go through all sorts of stages of uh, being infiltrated and being taken over and being swallowed uh, in the end. And as a Hong Konger, uh, I don't want the world uh, to face the same fate. We have to learn from the painful lesson of Hong Kong. That's why I would say that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is one of the greatest threats uh, apart from uh, the current Russian regime. And on the other hand, of course, uh, for people like myself, we are facing safety risks. For Hong Kong uh, activists or for uh, different Chinese dissidents, we are facing uh, severe safety risks. That's why I was ambushed and bitten to near death in London. Well, Finn, thank you so much for sharing your powerful and frankly harrowing story. Um, I don't think we've had anybody in the series that has actually put physical life and limb on the line in a way you have for what you believe in. So I want to thank you for joining us. And if you want to share how people can get involved, how they can help out, how they can reach you if they need to, um, anything like that, now is your opportunity. Well, I would say that uh, everyone, maybe a journalist, maybe uh, you are a politician, or maybe you are just a uh, one of the general public uh, so you could feel free simply to message me on Twitter. You know, so yes, under the name Finlao, then you could simply reach to me. Awesome. Then thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, bye.